Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Maris Kreisman, and I run events and marketing in McNally Jackson. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event for the store. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming days and weeks. Please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of our conversation tonight for your questions. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have, and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening, so start thinking now. Um, we're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've changed phases from staying at home to opening for curbside pickup again, to again admitting customers into our four locations. Indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Um, I will be posting you, barraging with you with links to buy A Certain Hunger from McNally Jackson in the chat. In a rave review published in the New York Times today, Amy Silverberg says, the descriptions of violence and gourmet cuisine in A Certain Hunger are so visceral that I felt alternatingly hungry and sick to my stomach. The writer Janet Fitch says the author's ultimate goal is to give readers a pleasurable inner conflict, wanting to turn the pages faster while also lingering on each beautifully written sentence. With Summers's writing, I kept rereading sentences only as a double take, whispering to myself, man, this lady is screwed up which is, I'd argue, its own kind of pleasure. I'm so delighted to introduce Chelsea G. Summers. She's a freelance writer whose work focuses on sex, politics, tech, fashion, and culture. She's a former academic and professor with a PhD training in 18th century British literature, a discipline that has proven to be shockingly useful when writing about contemporary culture. She was a columnist for the now defunct adult magazine, has a piece upcoming in Roxane Gay's Mutant series, and her work has appeared in Vice Fusion, Hazlitt, The New Republic, Racked, and The Guardian. She splits her time between New York and Stockholm, Sweden, where it is now 1 a.m. And this is her first novel. Joining her in conversation tonight is Matt Johnson. He's the author of the novels Pym, Drop, and Hunting in Harlem, the nonfiction novella The Great Negro Plot, and the comic books Incognito and Dark Rain. He's a recipient of the United States Artist James Baldwin Fellowship, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and the John Dos Passos Prize for Literature. He's a faculty member at the University of Houston Creative Writing Program. So happy to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maris. Is now when I read? <laughs> now I can unmute. Yeah. No, okay. th thank you for the lovely introduction. <laughs> Sorry, I was sitting there trying to unmute. Now I know how my students feel. And j just so I point out, I'm at the University of Oregon, so they don't like fire me for naming the wrong university. Um, Welcome, Chelsea. I, I've been listening to you forever online, complain about writing the book, complain about the struggles it is, and now you have this amazing thing. So why don't we start off with you sharing uh, a bit so that everybody can get a taste. Um, cool. So uh, this is from the third chapter. It's nothing particular. This chapter doesn't have anything particularly gross, so nobody has to cover their ears at any point, nor does it have anything particularly sexy. Sorry. Just as most people don't wake up and become a murderer, most don't wake up and become a food critic, but I did. Embracing this particular skill set felt like slipping into a bespoke garment, something cut to flatter my exact idiosyncratic body. And yet, however much I feel put on this planet to instruct people on how, what, and why they should eat, I am compelled to admit that my vocation as a food critic wouldn't have been possible without men. I owe them so much. In 1990, you had to squint to glimpse the internet looming. In today's death rattling time of newspapers and magazines, it's hard to recall that just a quarter century ago, print was basking in a halcyon moment. It seemed as if every day of the early 90s hatched a new four-color magazine. It was a dizzying time of weighty glossies with oddly specific names like Egg, Paper, George, Spy, Blurt, 
and spin. These magazines, I believe, foretold the days of single word restaurant names, plum, parm, sauce, supper, den, carnivore, and home. Ideas, print, writers, and money mushroomed with sweet yeastiness. One begat another, which begat another, which begat another, and before you knew it, you had a giant amorphous mass of words and people, pages and layouts, advertisers and editorials, subscriptions and readers, all demanding constant feeding. During these Twin Peaks, Pretty Woman, Ice Ice Baby days and cocaine-fueled nights, ideas grew with fungal fecundity, but relationships were traded like currency. It was all about whom you knew, whom you blew, and whom you'd yet, yet, whom you'd yet to screw. You just had to be at the right cocktail party, at the right gallery opening, at the right restaurant, in the right club's bathroom, doing the right drug, on the right coast, in the right tight black skirt, thighs pressed to the right person in order to find your name on a masthead of some slick publication. And that was the way I found myself the food critic for noir. I remember the night I found myself in Beignet wedged beside Manhattan playboy Andrew Goshen on the restaurant's beige Nubuck banquette. Over the thudding bass of CNC music factory in a sea of upended vodka shots, I shouted that the braised malpac and lemongrass creme tasted like a 15 year old boy's fantasy of cunnilingus. I remember Andrew heard me and laughed. I remember going home with him. I remember vaguely some assertively athletic sex that ended up in a misfire. I remember waking in Andrew's Tribeca loft, and I remember his sperm drying on my belly like donut glaze. Andrew propped on one elbow, looking at me appraisingly. I want you to be the food critic for my new magazine, he said. Noir, he said, would take a dark sideways look at culture, fashion, politics, art, and pretense. I'd be perfect, he said. Of course, I said, drawing an idle doodle with his spunk. He'll pay me $4,000 a column. We sealed the deal with a sloppy kiss and a squelchy fuck. I say I woke up and found myself a food critic, but it's equally true that my life's sinuous lines led me to my career. Looking back on it now, as I often do, prison really facilitates introspection. I feel as if I was raised to write about food. Just as dairy cows are raised to give milk, nebbiolo vines are cultivated to make wine, or civet cats were created to defecate the world's best coffee, I was raised to give voice to food's consumption. In retrospect, it seemed fated to be, and much to my distaste, it begins with my mother. You see, unlike most Americans born in the early 60s, I was reared on handcrafted food. Like Daniel Ballou, I never ate store-bought store bread unless I was at a restaurant. I never ate store-bought anything. My mother made her own bread, kneading it with measured sensuality, dough drying in the crescents under her nails. She grew her own tomatoes, then she canned them, and then, using the, then she used those jarred tomatoes to make fragrant cassoulet, salty steam rising as from a bagno. She drove to the dairy and carted home great pails of unpasteurized milk, which she then made into her own butter, yogurt, and creme fraiche, great creamy yellow cups of it. She'd pour it un unguent and fragrant and drizzled with honey over berries sun warm and brambly. My mother grew the berries and kept the bees too. She made it, she made it all, and she made it well. She stood with her arms akimbo in her Connecticut garden. She strode her kitchen as a colossus. In our own small world, she was the great ever-giving mother, maker of mysterious soups, magical stews, peerless fluffy loaves of bread, shiny fruit tarts glowing like family jewels, crispy juicy brown hunks of roasted meat, vegetables cooked so crunchy tender that your teeth wept. Ooh, I lost my place. Pottages of cream, sauces of juice, mysterious dishes of rice and herbs, salads that slayed you all from produce grown in my mother's own meticulously kept garden or from ingredients sourced with an alchemist's care. 
My mother was a witch in the kitchen and a Demeter in the garden, and we hated her for it. My father worked all day, churning out advertising copy with an electric mind that crackled and popped with, with syntactic snaps. His kinetic brain prickled with quick, thick witticisms that sold stuff well and reliably. He worked long, late hours, time that, as it turned out, was punctuated with a series of mistresses, women whose identities blurred furry into a string of pronouns and epithets, her, she, that one, that bitch, your whore. I'd hear my parents argue in raw, hushed tones, my mother making a show because propriety demanded it. In truth, she expected more integrity from the jars of preserves in her pantry. A man given to 60 to 80 hour work weeks, my father's home was less his castle and more his weekend office. My mother, who ruled our, our home with a flowered fist, was nominally, philosophically, and aesthetically French. Her francophilia inflicted, inflected her speech, her cooking, and her red lipstick that she wore even when tending her garden, her hair tied up in a careful bun, giant gloves on her hands, faded cotton jacket on her back, and wellies on her feet. Her faux Frenchness enabled her to roast a chicken to succulents, then take that chicken and, with a shaman's magic, turn it into an evolving kaleidoscope of meals. Roasted chicken became chicken in aspic, chicken sandwiches, chicken stock, chicken with dumplings. My mother made a roast chicken stretch forever, an unblinking eternity of chicken. Taking her work as head nurturer seriously, my mother lived to feed her three children, my two younger siblings, one son and another daughter, and me, from her garden, her pantry, and her larder, places defined by my mother's necromantic abilities, Protestant determination, and single-minded snobbery. Protestant, after all because my mother was fake French. She was like a gilded Louis XIV chair in a despot's palace, a knockoff. In contrast to my ever-present stay-at-home mom, my father was a presence in equal parts ephemeral and unchanging. He smelled like tobacco and brown liquors. His voice sounded like an emery board. He carried his slender body with a slight, resigned defeat, even as he made the kind of money and owned the kind of property and gave his Gen X children the kind of education that defined privilege. My father was always precisely dressed, Brooks Brothers during the week, L.L. Bean on the weekends, and Ralph Lauren for special occasions. He complimented, he complimented the wood beam and cotton duck farmhouse like he'd been purchased to match. Limited as my father's home life was, you could set your watch by his presence, even if that presence felt as solid and as visually perfect as a cinematic projection. Together, my parents constructed a Potemkin village for our nuclear family. It looked good from the outside. But every family has secrets, and my family's was me. Thank you. That was wonderful. There's your first public reading for this book. Out of the way. <laughs> Thank it's you. All downhill from here. Whew. So um, there's a lot of stuff that you are doing so well in the book that's evident in, in that uh, sample you gave us. But let me start with the most obvious. Um, why did you util utilize the memoir format for this? What, what, did, what was attractive about that as opposed to uh, so many other ways you could tell the story? Um, so I got into writing through a profoundly confessional blog um, called Pretty Dumb Things. It was online from about 2005, and then I finally took it down in like 2014. Um, and it was the, it, you know, it was all about me. It was me, me, me. Um, and so the memoir writing felt really, really, really familiar. And it was something that I felt confident in. Um, and I just, fell in love with Dorothy's voice. Like I fell in love with her over the top, um, snide, snarky, and uh, you know, telling kinds of 
lines. So once I started writing the book and I got into it and I, and you know, I, I got her, I nailed her voice. I was like, why would I do anything other than that? Yeah. So then the challenge became, well, all right. So here is this person that I know is a murderer. Why would she be writing a confession? Um, and so the only way to make sense of that logically is she's already in prison, which you know from the very first chapter. Yeah, and it, it works so well. It's interesting because it's it's not a superficial uh, attachment of style. Like there's points where oftentimes when you read a regular memoir, they mention something that they assume the reader knows because they're famous for it and then goes, goes back. And she does, or you do that with her voice uh, several times and it gives a real feeling of authenticity. Um, was that in, on purpose? Did you, because yeah, yeah. you got yeah, that voice much. and that memoir style. Yeah, um, you know, like, so I started writing this in 2011 and uh, I finished the first draft in I think 2014. Um, and then there were, you know, a few, like once I finished, I was like, okay, now I know what it is. And then I, then I went through and revised it and we worked a bunch of scenes and, and um, you know, made those moments where it felt like she had depth to her life, depth to her career, a sense of history and a sense of like, you know, I wanted her to come across to like somebody like Gail Green, that you already are familiar with who she is. That's why you would read the memoir. Um, and, and built that in as a, as a kind of a, a nod to the, um, you know, the tropes of that kind of, of a semi-celebrity memoir, but also to create a, a sense of her, of her being very much of this time and place. I ex expected it to be smart. I expected it to be funny. Um, but Thanks. one of the things that really, like this is from reading your work over the years. Uh, one of the things that um, was even like more uh, impressive and jarring was the language. I mean, there is so many, like, I'm not just saying this to fill your head up. There's so <laughs> many lines here. But please, please do. Feel okay, free. <laughs> please, no. There's so many lines here that I had to like stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like it, particularly like a good book trains you how to read that book, right? And And the first chapter, immediately it was like, okay, this is a voice I hadn't heard before. So I wanted like, what were your influences um, as far as the poetics of your language and, and that style? Angela Carter, um, very, very much so. I really wanted to go for Baroque. Um, I mentioned Gail Green, I read her, I read like the first half of her memoir very early on in the writing process. And there was a kind of a, like a snarky chattiness that I really loved. So I, I took that. Um, then Brett Easton Ellis, uh, American Psycho, the, the kind of a, you know, ironic detachment from, from um, the character's own actions. Um, and then MFK Fisher, whose, whose food writing has always been incredibly special to me. Um, because there's a sense of there's the food, the experience of the food and, and the experience of, of that meal. And then there's the experience of the time and the company and the memories and all of these kinds of a bricolage of, of, of thoughts and feelings that go along with this particular dish or moment or, or time in history. Um, so that you know, like those would those would be the big ones, and then and then you know definitely Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, I I read like the first two thirds. I read Eat and Pray. I ditched it before Love, um, but I, there was a there was a thing. Of, you know, there was just kind of a sense of like the way that she told the story, but also her magazine writing. Like she's done some of my favorite profiles of. Uh, like the Coyote Ugly profile, because she did a profile of um, Serge Hoshar, who was a winemaker in Lebanon that was just like perfection. So um, her writing as well. Yeah, every time you, you even just now, like, have these wonderful descriptions about what it is to write about food, 
the whole time I'm imagining the scene in the book where she slices up her ex's buttocks and serves it, uh-huh. right? Which is like <laughs> delivered with the same sort of detail, you know, and as somebody who like got through grad school working at Sagat, it was really uh, creepy to see those kinds of connections that were very uh, clear. Um, with the with the Brett Easton Ellis part, the American Psycho part, as soon as like, you know, as soon as the book, I saw the book, you know, doesn't matter how near or whatever it is that book, it's going to be referenced as like a gender inverted version of that book. But yeah. this isn't that. It's it's actually a lot, um, well, in my opinion, a lot more. But the um, one of the things that you do do that, that I think that American Psycho does in, incredibly well is capture a very specific moment in time Mm -hmm. um, and go all in on what Mm -hmm. it felt like to be in that moment. And you do that with a couple different moments here, the 80s, the 90s, and basically up up to 2008 and the publishing of Apocalypse. Yeah, like 2000. Was that the idea? 2012, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I think that the big difference between me and Brett Easton Ellis on the fact that, you know, I'm a chick is that, you know, I wrote this as a 50 something year old woman and he wrote his book as a 20 something year old guy. And so, you know, I, I lived, I lived through, you know, the eighties in Boston and the nineties and, and aughts and, and tens in, in New York. Um, and then also in, in Italy. Um, so it was a, it was a choice to evoke these, I pulled very heavily from memories that I had or things, stories that friends had told me and, you know, just, and, and tried to make it feel really real. And, and also part of it was I, you know, being in my, in my late fifties, um, I came of age reading books in the eighties. And so I have a deep and abiding visceral love for eighties fiction. So like, whether it's, you know, Tama Janowitz, Slaves of New York, or whether it's, you know, Brett Easton Ellis or Bright Lights, Big City, or, you know, like uh, Donna Tartt, um, Secret History, like there's, there's just a whole bunch of 80s stuff that is really, continues to be really real for me. And part of writing this book, as I got into it, I didn't like, I wasn't like, I want to write the best 80s book in 2020. But, um, you know, like I, that, that, uh, you know, was kind of, realizing okay this is this is what i'm doing i'm writing something that has that 80s feel when you look at american psycho you see that um the the kind of like what we call now toxic masculinity taken to an extreme Mm -hmm. your work here like um it just it reminded me as someone who's who's you know around the same age who was also in new york at that time it it reminds me of a of a similar idea in the sense of taking the essence of the moment and expanding on it and that um that element of consumption and the glee and consumption is in, is in every sentence here it feels like what did you originally um had the idea of taking that metaphor as far as you could go and going for the cannibalism or did it just pop- oh no the cannibalism was in it from the very beginning yeah so i went my company i was a wine writer in uh in, until for a mark for a wine company until august um and uh i started there in 2010 and my company sent me to italy in 2011 and when I was going, a friend of mine was like, oh, you can write the, you know, the new Eat, Pray, Love. I was like, yeah, I'll write Love, Pray, Eat. And then I was like, actually, that's a good idea. Um, so I knew from the very beginning what there was, it was about cannibalism. Um, I didn't really know, that, I didn't know I was writing a satire until I finished it. I didn't really, I didn't plan the book. There were a few moments, a few beats, a few images um, that I knew I wanted to hit as I was writing it. And then I just sort of like turned it over to my Damon, um, you know, the, uh, who was a red bearded vulture who sat on the, you know, next to me and told me what to write um, and just sort of figured out what was the connective tissue and how to make sense of it. So I didn't know that it was going to be so much about consumption until I finished it. 
you, you do something here too that I think like a lot of early stage writers don't realize is, is a, a great idea is you, um, you have an incredible skill for writing about uh, food. You have incredible skill for writing about specific moments in history, about uh, erotica, and also just having this kind of confessional tone in your existing uh, work. And I think like you see them all merged here and what you're looking at when I read it, is not just one book, but a, a career and an oh, artistic career you. that got you to this point. The erotic aspect of it, which is given that same sort of uh, delicacy at some points, and there's some lines in there that I will never forget that I will uh, talk to you about it some other time and, and not in public <laughs> about them. Okay. But um, how I mean, writing the erotic is incredibly difficult. It's easy to go comic. It's easy to go uh, into something that's just kind of hollow and pornographic. You manage to have it always feel charged. How do you do that? So uh, my blog was uh, was it was a it was a blog of sex. Um, I wouldn't call it a sex blog because it wasn't just about sex. But um, I've always been really interested in how you move, how you turn physical experiences into language, because there are two things that are not supposed to hold hands. Um, and in fact, when you have sex, as particularly as a woman, your critical thinking turns off. It's a, it's a, from what I understand, it's an evolutionary kind of um, aspect of our brains while, while having sex. Um, so I've always really loved that challenge. And a lot of, a lot of what I do has to do with the syntax. Like, um, I, I, I work really hard at how to tell the story in a, on a sentence level that feels disrupted, that feels like it reads like it feels like there's a kind of a, a sense of like, does it ring true to my physicality or not? Um, and so that's, I mean, that's really just how I do it. Like I, 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 I break down the sentences and I mess them up. That's, that's a great way to describe it. So you had all these existing skills that this allowed you to, to, to take to a next level. Over the course of writing this book, uh, what new skills came about? I mean, usually a first-time author, it's a, you're learning a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. You know, every time I write, I feel like I am. Every time I start something new, I feel like I'm jumping in off into a void, and it's always a leap of faith. Um, the the most important thing I learned in writing this is that I could finish it. <laughs> you know. Um, because I don't, you know, like I didn't do the MFA thing. I didn't have a writer's group. I didn't like, I just, I, what happened was I, I had worked with Molly Crabapple on her memoir, D Drawing Blood. And um, she is such, so devoted to her work and has such unshakable confidence in herself that I came away from it. Like, you know, I just need to fucking finish the bitch. Sorry, Maris. Um, I have to finish the bitch. I just have to finish the bitch. And then once I finish it, you know, if I, if I'll know what I have, I can, you know, maybe I throw it out, maybe I start something new, but at least I'll have done that and that's enough. And that was really the thing that was, that, you know, that I, I, I learned the most. It was about perseverance. And then like, as you know, I, I think, as you mentioned at the very beginning, you know, there were a lot of, there were a lot of tribulations in getting this book to being published I had like 30 rejections so so just sort of finding people um, you know like my my agent Jen Uden and and other people like friends and who really believed in it and were just like no nah, it'll 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 work it'll happen it'll just have faith so those were those were the things that I learned the most because I tend to be I come from a, a long line of dour pessimistic people um, and this was the thing that shook that. And, and then I guess the other thing was, it was, a, it was a time when I was able to take my anger and heartbreak and spite and turn it into something really constructive and wonderful. And, um, and that made me really happy. It's funny because there's an actual scene in the book where her sort of friend 
tells her just right, just right, just right. Just, and yeah, you can hear, do the work. You, can, you know it's coming in part to the author at the, at yeah. the same time. There, so you, you talk about that. I think, I don't know about you, but when I first started writing, I thought you write a book and it becomes a big hit and then you have a big career or you write a book and nobody reads it and then you never have a career for the rest of your life. You've had a really exemplary career in that it's been very individual. And that yeah. goes for your extended career, but also with this book. So 30 rejections, you find yourself ultimately at, at Unnamed, which is a wonderful indie press. Well, first in Audible. Just, so oh, Audible for, bought, that's yeah, right, first that's right. Audible bought it as an Audible original, and it was exclusive to Audible for a year. And then, uh, and then Unnamed bought it, um, and it came out today. And also today is a is a rave review in the New York Times, and you yeah. also had a very nice review. In, An in amazing review Republic in the New York well. Public, yeah, yeah. yeah it's so, it's... is this a, like, does this feel like a reward for all that, or does very it, much? There's... Yeah, yeah. It feels it feels a lot. Uh, it feels a lot like a vindication for um, you know the 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 number of times that I've been, you know, rejected or. Uh, you know, people have a tendency to, uh, and by people, I mean specifically editors um, and sometimes other writers um, to dismiss um, writing that is explicitly erotic. Um, I remember one time talking to uh, an editor of a magazine that I really wanted to write for. It was like at a very painful Christmas party. And, um, and he was like, so what do you write? I was like, well, I, you know, I mostly write about sex. He goes, oh, well, that's always um, very profitable. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, bite me. <laughs> and then I, I just, I just like, I walked, I looked at him, I was like, yeah, I guess so. And then I just walked out of the Christmas party. <laughs> it's just like, I can't take this. So it does feel very much like a vindication and particularly being an emerging author and, you know, like, my like late middle age or middle age is is pretty pretty cool because we spend so much time as a culture you know as a like squashing the voices of people who are you know who are you know okay boomer although i'm really okay very very early gen x um and and in specific like like silencing middle-aged women um so it's really cool to have a book that you know was written by a middle-aged woman and is about a middle-aged woman and is about her experiences that people are really connecting to um, so far, and that's that's really nifty. Yeah, and and your writing about the erotic is really like it, it's not just vivid, and the scenes really bring it to life in a way that doesn't feel, you know, uh, cheap or unwarranted or 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 anything, but something that sort of transcended but also the, you know, those riffs you have like about like for instance one of them is about men uh, tend to have their sexuality stunted at some point and never move on after that yeah. point which I was like well I never thought oh yeah yeah that's probably that's probably true right so that was so, actually the theory of a friend of so I was a stripper in the uh, in the 90s in New York and um and that was a theory of one of my stripper friends she was like, nope, they fixate and that's their thing. And they never really move beyond that. I'm like, that is genius. I will be questioning that for the, like of other people for the rest of my life, I think. I don't think I'll ever forget that part. There's also parts in here um, where it feels like, I'm not sure if you just know a ton of information about little obscure things like the truffles, or if you were doing research for them. One I of the ones that's the really hell powerful- out of it. Yeah, but you and your background is a is a is 18th century lit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the there's a huge tradition of the cannibal in 18th century lit and and like um like historic. When you get into that riff, it seems clear. Was that part of the the idea around it? Um, I think that yeah, having you know, so I'm ABD. Uh, you know, I'm all I'm all but dissertation. I bailed on the uh, the program before I finished, and there's always the there's always a burning pedant in me that wants to teach somebody something, um, and so anytime I have that kind of opportunity, I, I will just 
take it out and do it. Um, I don't think I was intentionally thinking about the, you know, the, the 18th century fixation with cannibals, although, you know, like Orinoco, uh, Robinson Crusoe, I mean, on and on, but, um, but it, it, it undoubtedly informed the writing. So if you could go back then, I mean, over the course of this journey, uh, and tell yourself something for, you know, as a beginning writer, for the other people who are maybe still working on their first book or thinking about it, what would you tell yourself at this point? Just do it. Hurry up and do it. Yeah. Find your theme song, find your spirit, you know, your, your Damon next to you on the couch, find the thing that, that will push you to do it, but just do it. Write the thing. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I wish I, and on some level, I wish I hadn't waited this long. On the other hand, I'm so happy with my gory angel baby of a novel that I'm fine with it. When you were writing those cannibalism scenes, um, they're really vivid and you really bring them to life. And I mean that as a compliment, even though there were some points I had to pull away for a, a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> Were these, were this just coming out of the imagination? Was this based on some, uh, you know, culinary techniques? Where did, how did you come up with them? Um, it was mostly imagination. Uh, like, um, some of them, you know, like some of the murders she plans out really meticulously and others go horribly awry. And, and it was important to me, like when I got into the middle of the one that went horribly awry without like going into it too much, um, I, uh, I wanted, I was like, oh my God, I'm just gonna have to scrap this whole thing and rethink it. I was like, or I can put her in this situation where things go horribly awry and have her deal with it. Like, what would she do? And so that's what I ended up doing. I was just like, well, what's the problem solving that this character would have in this scene that went horribly awry? Um, when I was writing the gore, I worked really hard to make it as uncomfortable as possible. Like I, I didn't, like you talked a little bit earlier about how um, erotica sometimes comes across as like gratuitous or comes across as, you know, like you want, you kind of want to laugh at it or like it has a high squick factor. Like I wanted to take the same kind of sensibility I have with writing about sex to writing about the gross stuff so that there would be a physical reaction to it, um, that it would feel authentic and that I wasn't shying away and that I wasn't like afraid to go there that it just like you got a you got a visual and it was going to stick with you yeah you, you mentioned that the um the murder that gets out of hand one of the themes in the book that is is, is implied is control I mean she is completely confident she's almost always in control and then those brief moments where she's not, you can almost feel the panic like coming yeah. through the page and, and big and small. Uh, wh where was that coming from? Was it also you struggling with control over the manuscript or does it just come out organically? Uh, excuse me. No, it really was about my character, Dorothy Daniels, like having her feelings, like having her like living, like ha like trying to write her story in a way that felt like, all right, this is how she would react. Like if this, you know, like she is, she is somebody who's so, who needs to have the upper hand all the time that when she loses it, she doesn't, she's, she's so unmoored. She has so little sense of who she is in the world if she isn't at the top that she has to steal it back and, um, still that control back, still that moment back. Um, and as I got into deeply into the book, um, those moments were even more important to me in terms of the logic of why she would be telling this story from prison. 
Right, like regaining control of her own narrative ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, or I think we're getting up to time for question for the room. So the last like mandatory question for me uh, is, uh, I, I hate it when people ask me, but I ask you, what what is next? So I'm working on a historical novel. Um, it's, uh, it is set in like the late 17th century. So a very overlooked time period. People love, you know, the, the Regency period. People love the, you know, the, the Renaissance, but people really are not so into. And of course you just had all the, you know, the, the Wolf Hall series of, of the inter, of the, of the Cromwell years. But um, so it's after that. Um, and it is like, there are, there are historical figures who are actual actual historical figures and then, you know, made up characters interacting and um, yeah, that's, that's the next thing. All right, excellent. Um, okay, I'm lo looking at stuff. Oh, from Henry Kaysen, my former student. Hi, Henry. Uh, this, uh, your book has been released as an audio book but someone else read it. Um, I think today a proven, has proven a version recited by you would sell even more. What are your uh, thoughts about thanks. reading it all yourself for such a release? Um, I think Hillary Huber did an amazing job. She actually can speak Italian, whereas I thoroughly fake it. Um, and she does voices and I really don't. Um, but, uh, but that's a very nice compliment. Thank you. Okay, here's, a, here's another one. Um, this book beautifully captures a 20th century moment. Thinking about your graduate work in literature, uh, said, I'm wondering if you found any 18th century influences or voices creeping in. Um, hmm. You know, I, so yeah, act, actually, uh, Lawrence Stern, Tristram Shandy um, is one of my favorite books. And the, in the original version of the, um, of uh, like in the original versions of, of this manuscript, there were a lot more digressions that marked themselves as digressions. But I would say that the digressionary character where, where Dorothy just sort of goes off on these tangents was very much informed by Tristram Shandy, which is like, ah, oh, one of my favorites. Yeah, and I was reminded of that when I was reading it, all those 18th century and 19th century uh, memoirs, basically, autobiographies, yeah. Yeah. and then novels and, and, that pretended yeah, and of to course, be that. Yeah, and of course, Tristram Shandy is a, is a fake, uh, memoir, you know, so, um, so there, and also like, you know, and then, you know, the, I would say also, also, uh, um, um, Daniel Defoe's Roxanne, like that was another, another book that, um, I, I love with an intense passion and then, and then, you know, John Cleland's memoirs of a, of a woman of pleasure, Fanny Hill. Um, I would say that those, those three 18th century books probably informed it yeah and all those are books that um, I think com combine really intelligent innovative writing with books that are actually fun uh, and entertaining yeah I mean the thing that really drew me to the 18th century as a as a period that I wanted to study was that it was so messy like nobody really knew what they were doing when they, you know, it was the birth of the, of the English novel it was just a white hot you know like mess, like hot mess express. And I love that. Um, and I, you know, like in writing this book, because I, I don't have formal training as a, as a novelist, I want, oh, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to go in as writing something that would be like, um, you know, uh, like weird and different and feel weird and different from, you know, the other crimey, foody kinds of things I'd read. Well, you definitely did that. <laughs> I think that was definitely success. We're, we're, uh, let me see, is there any, no, uh, if you have any questions, you can, um, you can put them in and I'll put it up. Uh, would love to hear more about Janice's thoughts on how food writing has evolved over the past decades. Oh, wow. Um, I think we're in a remarkable age of food writing. Um, one of my current favorite writers 
Well, there are a bunch of really amazing people writing about food. I mean, Helen Rosner at the at the New Yorker is just like she does these even her her like little Substack emails are these layers about, you know, about how we understand and come to food and and how it, you know, like how it works in our everyday lives and how we feel about it and what it means to us and why it's a drag and why it's, you know, wonderful and 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 she's amazing. I I think um Gabrielle, like the the writer chefs like Gabrielle Hamilton um and uh and Tamar Adler um you know who wrote a, an everlasting feast which is a I believe that's the name a cookbook that's not a cookbook or a lifestyle book that's not a lifestyle book and and has really helped me with my cooking um I I think that what has happened in in contemporary food writing is that we and you know of course Anthony Bourdain like brought food into a cult, more of a cultural setting like how it you know what food means not just what it is and um you know like as much as that's tiresome when you go to a blog and all you want is the freaking recipe for you know the the Sunday gravy um, it's also when it's done well, it's it's epiphanic. Building on that, uh, who do who do you read right now, um, writing about sexuality or kink? Is there any people in particular that pop out to you? I don't love reading sex writing. I uh, you know like I it's it's kind of like I have a lot of friends who are who who are porn performers. Um, I don't like porn. I have, you know, I have friends who write sex stuff. I, I generally don't love reading it. Um, it's a, it's just one of those strange things. I mean, you know, like I, I like, um, I, you know, I liked box and I liked, you know, I know that Fermata has had a lot of, it's semi canceled, but I really liked it. Um, and it really stuck with me, but, uh, but there's not a lot that I actually spend time reading that's not a surprise because you're so good at it it's kind of like you know somebody in the opera is not going to go listen to people sing in the alley you know <laughs> uh, it makes complete sense um as we i think we have a final one in uh what books uh, are you reading right now what's your reading list um so right now I, i've actually been reading the queen's gambit um, cause I watched the series and I really wanted to, I really wanted to read the book and see how, how it was adapted and, and see what the original was like. Um, it took much to, and I, like much to my shame, the Trump administration completely blew my concentration and ability to read. Um, and then the pandemic just like shattered it further. So I'm sort of clawing myself back into reading longer than, you know, things that are longer than article length. Um, but as I, I feel really, I feel really shame, I'm shame filled about it, but it's been, it's been really hard for me to concentrate on books. Yeah, I, I think that's fairly common, which is why, like right now, having your book come out now, a lot of other people's books come now, I feel like this is the first time I've been able to really appreciate it, you know, as opposed oh, okay. to those books came out in April, which yeah. was very hard paying attention to. So yeah. I think in that sense, it's good timing. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, good timing because this book is also, you know, as much about female rage and there's a lot we're angry about. That seems timeless. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Maris, is there anything you'd like to say? Hit? No. Um, final thoughts from either of you? Um, well, this was a great first event. Thank you so much. I want to say for, for those of you who haven't read it or thinking about reading it, it, it is smart um, and it is uh, beautifully written, but I think even more important, it's a damn good read. Uh, and I think <laughs> When you it, just pick up the first chapter, see what's going on there, and you'll you'll notice you haven't really read anything like that before. It's it's pretty unique. Yeah, please buy books, and thank you both, and thank you to this wonderful audience. And um, yeah, have a wonderful night. Well, thank you Thanks. so much.